I'm Alan Fenn at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and this is lecture number seven, experimental testing of high-resolution nulling with a multiple beam antenna. This is part of the lecture series Adaptive Antennas and Phased Arrays. Here's course content breakdown by topic. This is lecture number seven. We'll be covering some adaptive antenna theory in the context of jammer nulling. We'll be discussing some antenna measurement techniques. We'll be including array mutual coupling effects. And we'll be taking into account far field characteristics. The book, Adaptive Antennas and Phased Arrays for Radar and Communications, can be used to supplement this lecture. So the purpose of this lecture is to describe the design and measurements of a high-resolution adaptive nulling multiple beam antenna for EHF satellite communications applications. Here's an outline of the talk. After a brief introduction and background, I'll be describing the methods and materials, some results, and then summarize. So by way of introduction, adaptive antenna systems have been explored extensively by numerous researchers since the 1950s. And the primary functions of an adaptive antenna system are to minimize jamming, to suppress radar clutter, and to detect radar targets. In the context of an adaptive communication system, the adaptive antenna system would minimize jamming and maximize the signal-to-noise ratio from desired communication users. In this lecture, we'll be describing a multiple beam antenna adaptive nulling system. This slide shows two types of adaptive antennas for radar or communications. Adaptive antennas can be implemented either as an array antenna, as shown on the left, or as a multiple beam antenna, as shown on the right. Typically, you want a main beam or a number of main beams to cover a field of view for targets or communication users. And if there's interference presence, we want to be able to null out the energy from the interference or jamming sources. So in the case of an array, this can be either a linear array or a planar array or a conformal array. The array will have phase shifters, and the beam can be steered electronically over the field of view. In the case of a multiple beam antenna, it would typically be multiple feeds displaced from the focal point of the reflector or lens. And there are a number of beams formed from each of the feeds. These beams can be overlapped. So to summarize, the array has multiple antenna elements, and the MBA, or multiple beam antenna, has multiple feed antenna elements. Here's an example of a satellite communication system with multiple users and a jammer that's close to the user. What we want to be able to do is communicate with the user and null out the jammer. So typically for a satellite system, we'd have multiple beams for simultaneous coverage areas. We want to have rapid beam positioning, and we want high-resolution nulling to mitigate nearby jamming. Let's now talk about the methods and materials. For the example shown in this lecture, we're going to investigate a 127-beam multiple beam antenna. Here we're showing the Earth's field of view. And it's covered by interlaced beams coming from seven different lenses. Each of the lenses has two outputs that are generated by a switch network. These outputs go into an adaptive nulling processor producing three uplink beams, one, two, three, as shown here. So to cover the Earth's field of view, hexagonal packing of the beams is typically used in this 127 beam example. And every point in the field of view is covered by three or more beams. Overlap beams are generated by distributed lenses to affect or produce the narrow nulls desired to get the high resolution nulling. And the switch tree network selects two beams from each of the seven lenses. In this example, the adaptive nulling processor allows three simultaneous uplink beams. Here we're showing the overlap beams, and in any given region, we've got three beams covering this area. Here's a layout for the 127 beams 
in the 7 lens MBA system. Here's the MBA with the lenses labeled 1 through 7. And here's the 127 beams in the hexagonal lattice. And the beams are labeled 1 through 7, so you can see where each of the beams is coming from. In the nulling tests I'm going to show, lenses 2, 4, 7, and 5 are going to be used in the nulling test. Notice that the lenses are separated by 61 centimeters as shown here. And each of the lenses is about 20 centimeters in diameter. Here's the design of the 7 lens MBA. There's an aluminum truss which holds the lenses in place. Each of the lenses is a dielectric lens. And on the right we can see here are the feed horns illuminating the lens. The overall diameter of the antenna is 1.46 meters. Here's a photograph of one of the seven lenses in the 127 beam MBA. Here's the lens and the feed horns illuminating the lens and the switch tree is located behind the feed horns. This slide shows the overall layout of the feed array assembly and switch tree waveguide network. Here's the feed horn cluster. The feeds are located on a hemispherical plate. Here's the switch tree. You can see the two outputs and this diagram shows the 18 to 2 switch tree for one of the lenses. The outer lenses have 18 ports, 18 feeds. The central lens has 19 feeds. And so we're using these switches to produce two outputs from each of the lenses. Here's a measured radiation pattern of one of the feed horns for the 127 beam MBA. So the half power beam width of one of the feeds is 18 degrees. These data are measured using a spinning linear source. So it's good actual ratio at the beam peak. It's a conical horn with a dielectric tube inserted, which is used to produce the desired half power beam width, which is 18 degrees for this example. So these measurements were done at 44.5 gigahertz. Here's the completed 127 beam MBA. You can see the seven lenses. Here's the aluminum truss that holds the lenses in place. Tests were done in an anechoic chamber with a compact range reflector. The adaptive nulling algorithm used to form nulls is as follows. The sample matrix inversion algorithm can be used to determine the adaptive nulling weights, W sub A, by first computing the covariance matrix R and then inverting it, as shown here, and then multiplying by the quiescent weight vector. In our case, the covariance matrix R is obtained by measuring the received signal for four beams at five frequencies across the 2 gigahertz nulling bandwidth, and then computing the frequency average cross-correlations. The quiescent weight vector is assumed to be one of the channels and zero on the remaining channels. The nulling weight network consisted of mechanically adjustable RF attenuators and phase shifters. This slide shows a comparison of antenna test regions. I mentioned earlier that we did testing in a compact range for this multiple beam antenna. So the compact range distance is shown here and typically it's located from two to four aperture diameters from the antenna under test. In earlier talks, we talked about a focused near-field technique. And so here's a diagram of a compact range. The horn antenna that feeds the compact range, in our case, is assumed to be the jammer. And so the compact range produces a plane wave incident on the antenna under test, which in our case is a multiple beam antenna. So the conventional far-field distance would be r equal 2l squared over lambda. In our case, at 44.5 gigahertz, the far field distance would be 500 meters for this 1.22 meter aperture, whereas the compact range test distance is only 4 meters. Now let's show some results. Here's the measured radiation pattern for the center beam of the 127 beam MBA. So with the center beam on, we see a half power beam width of 2.5 degrees. This is a right-hand circularly polarized measurement. 
So this is for beam number four. Now as mentioned earlier, when we do the adaptive nulling, we use four of the beams in this example. So here are the measured radiation patterns before and after nulling for a single jammer. The quiescent coverage pattern is shown here at the top. So we see the, the beam on. The jammer is put in this position here at an azimuth of minus 0.4 degrees and an elevation of 0.85 degrees. Here's a layout of the lenses. And again, lenses 2, 4, 7, and 5 are used in the nulling. And so the adapted contours located at the single jammer position are shown here. We see a deep null, a narrow null formed at the jammer position. And if we look at a cut through the fixed elevation angle at the jammer position, here's the adapted pattern cut. The dash curve is before nulling, and the solid curve is after nulling. We see that a null is formed at the jammer position and there is sufficient gain over the field of view for a communication user to close the link. Here's the measured null depth for a single jammer. Again, we use the open loop sample matrix inversion algorithm. There are four nulling channels and we used RF weighting. So this is the null depth versus frequency from 43.5 to 45.5 gigahertz. And so the measured null depth is greater than 30 dB for a single jammer. Next we looked at two jammers. The quiescent coverage contours are shown here, and the jammers are shown in these small boxes. The jammers are located in azimuth of minus 0.7 degrees, elevation 0.4 degrees, and at azimuth 0.7 degrees, elevation 0.7 degrees. So here are the adapted contours at jammer number one and two. After nulling, we see deep nulls formed in the direction of the jammers. And these nulls are high resolution. So let's summarize. In this lecture, we've looked at a high resolution adaptive nulling multiple beam antenna system. This prototype system had 127 beams at EHF. We use the compact range system to test the four nulling channels and use the open loop sample matrix inversion algorithm and demonstrated 30 dB high resolution adaptive nulling for one and two jammers. The book, Adaptive Antennas and Phased Arrays for Radar and Communications, Chapter 7 can be used to supplement this lecture.